Welcome everybody, this is the SharePoint Developer Ecosystem, the BMP Community Call. It is December 10th, 2019. It is the last monthly community call of the decade. Uh, within a month, we'll be on a new, on the 20th again, which is wild. Now, let's actually get moving on today. So, a few news uh, from the SharePoint engineering site. So, some news, some development, uh, and all of that. Uh, then, acknowledgement of the community contributions uh, as well. Super important part of the monthly community call. Uh, and then, uh, we have like 40, 45 minutes of uh, time for Jax. And Jax is our PM owning the integration side and extensibility side with SharePoint and Power Apps and Power Automate. So, kind of the integration part of that side. And Jax is going to talk about um, what's the latest in there. Uh, latest and greatest on that side. Some things which you might have seen in Ignite, some things actually might have even evolved forward uh, since Ignite. So pretty cool to see uh, what's coming up on that side. If we have time, uh, we will have a Q&A uh, in the end. Um, it is a big if because typically we do not unfortunately have too much time on the monthly community calls uh, for those. But let's actually get moving. So for those who are not super familiar with what we do, uh, we do have different kind of layers and we always go through, through this in the monthly community call as well. And we do have SharePoint developer community in the Microsoft tech community, and we're trying to push everybody to have a random discussions over there. We do have the bi-weekly SharePoint framework um, uh, community call, which is more Q&A. Uh, there's typically two to three community demos and time for Q&A as well. The next one is on 19th of December. So we're going to keep the call, even though we're heading closer and closer to the holiday season as well. The bi-weekly SharePoint uh, general uh, dev is more around uh, CSAM, BMP, Microsoft Craft, Power Apps, and Flow integration and with the community demos as well. And the next one is actually as soon as this Thursday. So bi-weekly, uh, every single week on Thursday, we have a call. And then we have the monthly community call, which is this one, which happens once a month. Uh, and next one will be January 2020, which is quite wild, and uh, on Tuesday 14th of January. So different calls, different layers. It's up to you which of, which one of these calls you want to join. You don't have to join all of them. All of the uh, calls are being recorded and they're being shared using our YouTube channel. So you can easily access them afterwards as well. So it's making sure that you understand where the calls are, where the, where the information is available. Share on dev documentation, AKMS SP dev docs, upon dev videos are YouTube channel, which have more than 13,000 subscribers already, which is pretty cool. AKMS has data videos, uh, SharePoint dev issues. So if you have run into development API issues, dev issues, uh, that is a location to report them. And then we have plenty of open source stuff available for you to take advantage, either as a reference or as a guidance or as a reusable component uh, to take advantage within your, uh, within your work as well. Now, um, a few updates from uh, from the material and uh, let's say from an engineering side. Uh, so first of all, SharePoint Framework Developer Training Package has been actually updated yesterday. Uh, so we do have a December 2019 version and now out, which uh, was mainly adjustments on the slides and the hands-on labs and the demo material. So the videos are still the same, but we have done adjustments on the hands-on labs to make sure that they're matching whatever the, the current situation or is with the SharePoint Development Training. Uh, really, and this is a super power, uh, powerful training package. You can use it any way you want uh, for even, for example, further deliver the training for somebody else. There are videos, there are hands-on apps, there are presentations, there's demo material. So uh, it's up to you how do you want to use this material. You don't have to ask any permissions. If you want to train your team, train your customer or whoever, you can use them any way you want. Good. Uh, a few other updates. Uh, Hugo Bernier actually has worked on the gallery side of the house. Uh, so SharePoint Framework Extensions uh, sample gallery uh, was shared actually earlier today in social media. It has existed now for one or two weeks, unless I'm mistaken. And it's the same stuff as with the SharePoint Framework web parts. The whole point being on the fact that you can more easily access the SharePoint Framework extension samples, which are available in the GitHub for you. So super, super valuable uh, for you as well. Uh, AKMS SPFX extensions, that's going to redirect you uh, to the gallery. And you can access those samples using then a framework, SPFX version, the year, author, and keyword. So pretty cool setup, uh, which uh, Hugo Bernier has done uh, for both the extensions and for the web parts. And there's a really nice initiative uh, initially started by David, uh, which is a SharePoint is caring initiative. Uh, so this is actually for everybody in the community who don't feel comfortable of using GitHub. So if you kind of feel like, hey, um, I would like to contribute or I would like to use some of the samples, but I don't know what to do. 
how would I modify the, the documentation or how would I get started on these things? This is precisely targeted for that. And we do acknowledge and understand that quite a lot of actually people in the community are not quite up to date uh, on how to get, uh, how to contribute, what do you need to do or how do, what do you need to have and or how do you even consume the samples uh, which are available? And that's what the Sharing is Caring initiative is all about. Uh, AKMS uh, Sharing is Caring is the address. And then from there, you can find more additional information on how, what does it, what is it. There are monthly community calls and samples or calls where we, uh, Hugo and David, are helping one by one uh, people to get started on these things. So super, super valuable for everybody to learn how to take advantage of all of this community goodness and what we have. Now, uh, this one uh, is from Frank Cornu, uh, and actually a few other people who contributed on that one, building modern SharePoint experiences with SharePoint framework web parts. So just making sure that everybody is aware of this, we moved uh, the modern SharePoint uh, search web parts from the old location underneath the Microsoft Search GitHub location. And Frank Cornu has been the one who's, who's leading this. Uh, and, and making maturity of those web parts available. There's a nice documentation now available. We'll polish that one out uh, definitely as well, but they are super valuable. So you can really easily build almost like a classic search center experience in the modern SharePoint. So you don't have to fall back on the classic search center to have your search query web part and modifications or in XSLT. No, 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 not needed. There are web parts available, open source web parts available, which you can use uh, in here as well. And thank you, David, for sharing the link uh, in the chat window. Super helpful for everybody who's joining. Uh, super, super valuable stuff. Uh, have a look on that one. Uh, it is an open source initiative as well. Uh, Frank Corner has been working on that one um, and definitely looking at other contributors there as well. A few other things before we go to the contributors and monthly news. I still have some time before I need to let checks on the on the talking. Uh, SharePoint Modernization Partner Guidance uh, first release is out. Uh, this came out from Bert Janssen last week. Um, and obviously, we're looking into helping customers and partners to transition from classic SharePoint to modern because that's where we are investing and that's where the product is heading, that's where Microsoft is heading and the modern can be really easily surfaced in Microsoft Teams. The, the SharePoint could be considered as a, one of the, the most advanced applications which you can access to uh, Teams as well if you prefer uh, using Teams and, and Tribe Teams adaption. Um, but really SharePoint Modernization Partner Guidance is a quite simple for now uh, or it's the first version Saying that it's simple is, is not a good selling point. It's a first version where we keep on evolving, uh, but it basically it gives you an insight on, on how would you approach modernization and then uh, what are the steps, what are the tooling available for you to take advantage of there. We have plenty of open source tooling available and guidance and documentation on this one as well. And like I said, we truly, 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 truly encourage everybody to move to modern because modern is the way uh, where we are investing uh, in Microsoft. A few other uh, kind of advertisements or promos, uh, SharePoint Dev Weekly, uh, the latest one came out uh, today, earlier today. It was released a few hours ago. It was recorded yesterday. Um, we were planning to have a visitor with Waldeck and me. Unfortunately, the visitor got stuck in Norway in due to no storms, uh, so we were unable to actually make that happen. But we'll, we should be able to do that next week. And uh, so we will keep on doing the SP Dev Weekly. It's probably actually through the holidays. Let's see how it goes as well. Uh, in the SharePoint Dev Weekly, we go through the latest news from Microsoft and also the latest blog posts and, and uh, writings from the community side of the house. So if you are writing something in your blog, please let us know using the hashtag SP Dev Weekly so we can actually acknowledge that you're doing that and we can promote uh, your work as well. Now, uh, one thing what I was requested also to do from marketing side of the house, uh, I'm not from marketing, the other people are from marketing or some other people are from marketing, uh, is that we're looking into getting feedback on our community calls. Um, so this applies to every single Microsoft 365 developer community calls. Uh, so in not just SharePoint, but also the other ones as well. And um, this is really to understand um, how many calls there are or are there too many calls and what do you want us to do in the future? And last time when we did the similar exercise with SharePoint, uh, the conclusion was that what was it? 72% says, let's keep on having this amount of calls as we are having right now. Let's not reduce the calls because apparently people love these calls. And it's good to see that the chat is again super active and people are helping each other and sharing the links and all of that in a chat. So um, your input really, really, truly matters. So please fill in the survey. It takes like max five minutes um, for people to understand where we should be betting uh, or where we should be concentrating in the future as well. So thank you for that. Uh, 
Uh, some numbers from November, just uh, updating you on where we are going from a community and product side of the house. Uh, the usage of third party, so basically customer custom uh, SharePoint framework components uh, grew 7.5% worldwide. Uh, so quite nice growth um, in a month by month basis. Uh, so the usage is growing all the time. Uh, it is both uh, in classic and in modern. Obviously, majority of the SharePoint framework usage is in the modern side of the house, but it does work in the classic as well, uh, if you're not aware of that. Uh, we had almost 40,000 views in the SharePoint Dev YouTube channel, uh, more than 210,000 uh, watch time minutes in, the, in the, there as well. More than 63,000 total visitors in GitHub organizations. A lot of requests. It's an actually quite mind blowing uh, number. So, 6,846 requests every single second going through BMP components towards SharePoint Online or Microsoft Graph, to be honest. Um, so, mainly those SharePoint Online. Uh, so, 6,846 requests in a second. That's mind blowing. Um, considering, uh, and that gives you the scale of usage of the open source. Uh, components what we're having. So a lot of people are using them, more than 31,000 tenants uh, being using them. Uh, overall, we've been now having 1,215 uh, contributors in a GitHub organization. This is all time metrics, uh, which we're calculating since six years already. Uh, on SharePoint Framework, quickly, a few metrics on that one. It is growing, adoption is growing like I said. Uh, that's the growth chart. Uh, it is quite impressive. Um, so the, it is growing quite hectically uh, one month by month, uh, which is always a good thing. We are looking into uh, releasing, actually opening up uh, app source for SharePoint Framework components quite soon, which should further uh, help you as if you're a partner to then get your SharePoint Framework solution exposed uh, for a customer as well. This is actually happening, how would I put it, uh, uh, obviously not in days, maybe not in weeks, but within a small number of months uh, when the app source should be available for SharePoint Framework components and SharePoint Framework solutions. And there's, there will be obviously a news announcements on that one. Now, we originally targeted Ignite. Unfortunately, we missed that timeline, but it's now uh, we're catching up on as fast as possible. User-wise, nothing really dramatic on this side of the house. The support for .NET Core with CSAM is still the number one or crew to be the number one uh, in this month. We are actively working on that one. It is a sad, sad, sad story. And uh, we do understand that people have been slightly angry that we haven't been able to address that request yet. We are working on it. Uh, the same applies for the management of data term store operations through REST APIs, will be, which will be actually through Microsoft Craft. So there should be a preview versions of that one in the beta quite soon, relatively soon, um, because we've been actively working on that one for quite a long time as well. Other than that, uh, nothing too dramatic on the top 10 list of user voices. On the De December 2019 update, it is now available uh, in the, uh, our blog post, uh, so in, uh, in the SharePoint dev blog. Uh, it is calling out all of the contributors and different samples and changes which have happened within the last month. So it is, in, it is quite a long blog post, but it's intended to be the monthly summary where we mention everybody who contributed and also what has happened within the last month. So a lot of, lot of actions uh, have been happening in here. So all of the people who contributed, so these are the list of uh, people who were active during past month, uh, so during November. Again, a massive, mass, massive list of people. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being actively part of the open source community and the community work what we do here, because you are the fuel of making these things happen. Uh, so thank you, thank you everybody for, for being active on this side. Um, we basically help each other and we make, make a massive difference for everybody in the world uh, on helping things happen. Um, from a company side of the house, there was again quite a big number of companies uh, which allowed their employees to be part of the, the, the GitHub uh, contributions as well. So thank you for allowing your employees being actively involved. So super important thing uh, in the IT community as well. From Microsoft side of the house, a uh, few new people, few old people. Uh, so uh, quite a too big a list of people as well, uh, helping actively on this side as well. Um, I'm, I was rushing slightly, uh, but I wanted to make sure that Jax has a sufficient amount of time uh, for his topic, uh, because I know that he has a lot to talk about. So Jax. Today I'm going to give you some update, um, especially the Ignite talk I did. Um, if you want to see the full talk, there's the link in the slide, AKM as Microsoft Ignite 2019 SCR 30. Really simple to remember. Um, and if you go there, you'll see the full talk. Um, I thought I would give some uh, different uh, themes together and give a talk today and also give you an understanding of where we are heading. 
So for folks that don't know me, um, unlike Vesa, I have a picture of myself there, so a picture of Chucks. Um, and I started as a developer in 2007, SharePoint 2007, and then I worked as a developer, as a consultant, working on a lot of uh, SharePoint projects, deploying SharePoint on-prem web content management solutions. And then I moved to Microsoft uh, and joined the Visual Studio SharePoint developer tools and built all of the tooling for add-ins um, for the SharePoint 2013. And then I moved to SharePoint team when we were restructuring the entire dev platform and thinking about how do we move forward. So I was fortunate to work um, in the uh, team that uh, was uh, basically geared up the SPFX and, and all of the things that you see today. Um, and from there, after SPFX, I decided to go to the next journey of transforming the SharePoint business process automation, uh, which is one of the key areas if you look at uh, all of the uh, makers and end users that use you know, tools like SharePoint Designer, InfoPath, and now Power Apps and Flow to build business processes, whether it's a simple one or something complex to go and do multi-stage processes. Um, so business process solutions for SharePoint, really it starts with SharePoint list and libraries. Um, so with um, abundance features available with these list and libraries, you can really build a solution or an app and you know, go around to collect, manage, and distribute content. So we see there's a strong urge for uh, a need like that, uh, especially within uh, the Microsoft 365 ecosystem. And that's where the business process starts, right? You can start as simple as, I just want a list, but then you could quickly go into developing solutions with uh, low-code, no-code apps, like Power Apps and Flow, and start infusing the processes that you want. And if you even go further, you can even connect them to Power BI and other cognitive services to drive more um, insights from the data you have. So uh, there's a lot of investments going on uh, with SharePoint list and libraries to ensure that they are ready for businesses to adopt as apps so you can go build uh, on, on top of those list and libraries. But however, uh, we do want to have business process available to everybody, right? So it's not just for a specific class of people. We want to have a continuum that every user uh, using the list is able to uh, go and get what they want to do with the list and enable their users to get things done. So it really starts for us from a product team giving you all of the uh, power in the native efficiency, right? So I want to create a list. I want to send the list for collecting data. I want to have easier and quicker ways to uh, input data. So we're making a ton of changes there. You already saw uh, from SharePoint Conference, we have been making some changes to the new list experience, uh, create new list experience that also allows you to uh, create lists from an Excel file or from an existing list. And also, we're making a ton of changes to Quick Edit. Um, we know Quick Edit is being used a lot, and many, many customers love it. So we wanted to modernize that experience as well, which really we neglected for quite a while, right? So we are doing a ton of changes there. And we'll also, you'll also see us adding more column types and whatnot to uh, um, you know, surface some of the business scenarios that revolves around list. And then we really think about end users uh, need to have an easy way to do customizations and automations. And that's basically because there is data. What am I supposed to do with that? Well, I want to uh, organize the data. I want to like track something. I want to uh, make sure that when people come to the list, they're able to see the things the way they're supposed to see. If something is important, I want to highlight that. Um, so things like that, we really want to have inducers um, feel that these are really simple things and intuitive things that you can go configure. So we're making a ton of investments in that area. And as you go through the end, uh, we do feel that is a good continuum when you decide now it's the time to go build much powerful integrated solutions, right? So you could have your power apps, you could have your flow and run through business processes. You could go customize the list form the way you want, getting not only the data from the current list, but also maybe getting data from another list. So there are lots of possibilities now with these uh, tool sets from Microsoft to go structure the business process you have. So that's the way how we are looking at driving uh, business process um, across the different uh, users that we see every day. And uh, with native efficiency, uh, we 
are very close to releasing the easy list creation. I think most of you should have it at least in your first release. And if you are in the targeted, uh, sorry, the uh, production tenants, you should have it. Um, the Excel is coming soon in Q1. So once we deliver that, you'll be able to go to the new list experience and do from an, uh, from an Excel file. Uh, Teams integration, we, you can add a tab, uh, the list tab in Teams in a channel, and it will have the same experience as you would have in the uh, SharePoint site. And also, you could now add pages and uh, as well along with the list. So there's a ton of improvements in quick edits and list web part as well, especially with dynamic content. So if you want to get some data from another web part and based on that, filter the list web part or send the data of the list web part to another web part so it can uh, filter accordingly the web part to web part connections in the old world. Um, there's a ton of updates there as well. Now, all of those. Uh, if you go to this Ignite, Ignite Talk link, which is uh, Microsoft Ignite 2019 slash STR30, Lincoln um, has uh, some really awesome demos showing uh, each of those things that he was talking about in the native efficiency. I'm not going to go through those, but I'm going to focus more on the simple customization and the integrated solutions. So simple customization, uh, we started with really giving um, power users the ability to format list columns and views through JSON, right? And we know uh, it has got a ton of usage. People love it. Um, even people that are not uh, familiar with JSON, we saw them getting uh, up to date with JSON and basically working through the quirks. And we saw an awesome community participation. We have GitHub repos with columns and view examples, format as examples. So, uh, we went to the next step uh, in, a, in SharePoint conference we started and showed you how we are using now the same JSON but driving the end user productivity by giving them the user experience in list so you don't have to really type JSON. So we are adding a ton of improvements to that uh, project going forward. So you can see that we have some options like conditional color coding, a rule builder that you can use to build rules and drive uh, formatting through that. We also have rich text capabilities uh, uh, as well for applying formatting. So if you want to change the font, if you want to apply borders. So I'll show you a demo that will make more sense. We're also making improvements to having simple customizations available out of the box in the list forms. So you don't have to go to Power Apps to do those simple things. Now, those simple things could be, um, you know, many different things that you might think about, and you can categorize uh, simple or hard. but we're starting with three important things that we have heard from customers every time we talk about this. Uh, reordering the fields, right? I want to reorder the fields in the form. I want to show height fields because I don't want the, uh, this field to show up when I am entering uh, or editing the form, but I do want to see that field in the view. And finally, you also have the ability to conditionally show height fields. It's not just about uh, showing and hiding, but I do want to have this field show when another column value is equal to something, right? A very uh, typical scenario that we see every day that list users go through. So we're, we are uh, adding those features. Today, I think you should have reordering the fields available, at least in your targeted release tenant or first release. Uh, very soon, it will be available for all production tenants. Uh, reorder and show height fields. The conditional show height field is slated for uh, Q1 next year. So let's go to the demo. So here I have a list with features, um, pretty simple list, nothing um, uh, complex here. But if I want to make this list now more uh, feature-rich with the ability to let people know how these every row item is going to affect based on, let's say, uh, review date, I can do that very easily with the conditional formatting. So alternating row styles was something that we saw, but let's look at conditional formatting, right? And here, as soon as I go, I have the option to add rules. Now there is a rule for all values, right? Let's add a rule and say, if the review date um, is before today. So you can see that how um, easily now I can do this without needing to go write a JSON. I can choose today, which is straightforward, or specific date if I want to pick a specific date. Let's just uh, choose today. And now I can add more conditions to it. 
so that I can do AND and OR. Uh, but also now I get the option to decide how that row will look, right? So I can click the pencil icon to edit, and I can say, well, I want it to be sort of uh, red and, and teal and orange. But now I have the option of more styles. So if I do more styles, I get more options, obviously, with the more styles uh, wording. I can configure the font. I can do bold, so it's much uh, nicer when you look at with the background color. If I want, I can change the color of uh, the text too, so let's put it red. I can also have a border, right? And I can put the border uh, style here as well as the border color to be red. So really, really telling people that, hey, the review date is uh, way over the, the limit. And I can go back again, and you'll see that uh, rule is over here. And for all values, I can say, yeah, that's fine. I can choose blue, right? And I can do the same thing. I can go into more styles. I can bold it. And if I want to, I can also give a border and, and just have a color to it. Now, that is really, really simple. With few uh, steps, I was able to do the formatting. And now if I save it, uh, that's going to save the uh, formatting for this particular view. The same options are available for um, the columns as well. Let's say if you have a pri priority, for example, I can format this column. For this particular thing, I can say if priority is equal to one, um, I'm going to say more styles, and I get more support here because it's a number column. I get icons and borders as well. And because it's not a view, I can apply this styling for specific columns. So I can mark this as very important, right? And I can also make this, um, I don't know, let's make it purple. And I can save this. So that's one rule. I can have if priority is equal to two, similarly, I can select another um, icon, right? So it's really simple to now configure these rules and have them show up in, in your uh, view formatters. Now, the another thing we were talking about was the ability to show hide columns. So when you have the feature, if you go to the edit form, you'll now see two options. One is show hide and one is customize the power apps. So obviously, customize the power apps will take you to the power apps. Let's look at show hide columns. So now I can simply rearrange uh, the columns very easily here uh, that will apply to the list forms, which is out-of-the-box forms. And I can also see, uh, you can also see that I already have two things um, hidden. Title is required, so you can't hide it or uh, show because it's a required field. But priority contact has a condition. And the condition is really simple. It uses the Excel uh, style formulas. And it says if uh, priority uh, is equal to one, show the field. If not, don't show the field. It's really, really simple targeting uh, a very uh, straightforward scenario. What is the condition? And what am I supposed to do, which is true or false? True means we'll show the column. False means we'll hide the column. So with that in place, you can see that now I have the ability to, if I edit this item, the priority is three. Obviously, I'm missing a column. As soon as I type one and move away, you can see I got the priority contact column. Again, I'm typing two and tab. You can see the column go away if I type one tab, I see the column come back, right? So really simple uh, expression, which is Excel expressions that you can use to do this. Also, you can see the team size. It's something maybe you're doing it through a flow or some other means. You really don't want people to enter it. You might figure it out and do it. So if you don't want to show that, you can go and just take it out and then save it. Um, and now the team uh, size will go away from the form. So. Uh, these are the simple uh, customization options uh, we are doing in uh, the list out of the box forms. And what we are trying to also work with Power Apps integration piece is that uh, when you do customize with Power Apps, we are bringing all of these settings uh, right now except the condition. If you have reorder or show height fields, we will respect that and also have that uh, brought into the custom forms when you click Customize with Power Apps. And that's what 
we mean when we talk about Continuum, right? We give the abilities out of the box, and when you go and build an integrated solution, we take those settings and 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 drop you with the same place uh, where the custom form is set up, so that any user can go do it, and then you bring in uh, some consultants or even yourself going and doing customized power apps. You can uh, start with the same settings that you had in the out of the box form. So that's the demo for uh, simple customization. So integrated solutions, I think this isn't new. We have a ton of integrations uh, for end users or power users uh, to go and uh, do different things, especially in SharePoint, we have page approvals. Uh, by the way, HubJoin approvals is available in targeted release if you haven't seen the message in the post. Um, so you can try that too. Custom forms and, and other flow integration features in SharePoint. Of course, if people want a simple solution to get data and, and have surveys, we do have Microsoft Forms, uh, which we are now seeing uh, being adopted by um, several end users to go collect and, and see what responses they get. With Flow, you can easily now move those to a list as well. So I wanted to just spend some time and talk about the different things we released since SharePoint Conference. Um, we, we did release a ton of things, um, and it uh, really went into looking at for uh, Flow and Power Automate, it really looked into what other user-wise items can we go and uh, look at uh, fixing in the product or bringing those into the product. So we went and targeted the checkout, check-in scenarios, um, which was one of the top asked for, you know, not just through user-wise, but also through customer request. Uh, we also created the ability to create a folder. Uh, it's very simple now. We also have the ability to grant access to a file or an item and stop sharing a file or an item. Now, one of the feedback I hear is that, um, great, you have the ability to grant access, which is basically the set item level permissions. It's not working with SharePoint groups. Um, unfortunately, our investments are in the modern uh, group scenarios. And the modern SharePoint sites are really set up to function as an entity across M365 platform, especially with groups, right? So we are making sure that the solutions we build for customers are really uh, ensuring that they have long-term support. So SharePoint groups are great if you are working in a non-group solution. Uh, so right now we don't have support for that. Uh, we only have support for modern groups. So if you go to grant access, you will get the same set of uh, permission levels that you see in a group, read, edit uh, kind of thing. And it matches very well with the ability to grant access if you go through a SharePoint user interface. So that's the support we have. Unfortunately, we don't have support for uh, SharePoint groups. It could come later, uh, but it may not change this action. There would be a separate action to say get SharePoint group identity or something like that. Uh, request sign off, we did a ton of uh, reliability fixes, especially if you require approval and you open the document. Uh, now it won't affect you that uh, error that you are getting that, hey, we couldn't really complete the process, but the document is approved kind of message. So we fixed that issue uh, for request sign off. There are a ton of up, uh, updates to guest access support and authorization updates. Power Apps uh, also has guest access support. Uh, Flow supports guest access through B2B scenarios. So if you are Contoso and you have AdventureWorks coming in with Flow license and working in Contoso, Flow will use the license of that company uh, and acquire that and use it in your tenant. Uh, however, we don't have external users uh, as in not a B2B user support for Flow yet. Authorization updates, we did uh, support uh, improvements to conditional access climbs and delegated authorization scenarios. So if you have a conditional access climb, your laptop needs to be used only in a specific location, and you move away from that and you go try to use Flow, it will tell you that you can't use Flow from SharePoint as well. So we did uh, all of those improvements in Power Automate. Power Apps, we released the delegation for complex types, choice, lookup, person. Uh, we also have guest access support for custom forms. Um, so if you invite a guest user to a site, the custom form will work for them if they are invited to collaborate on a list. And uh, finally, we have uh, the maker improvements. I think it's really improving uh, the user experience for makers to do the things they want to do in the Power App Studio. Um, 
and there's ton of improvements coming later this year and and next year. But really, it comes down to uh, you know, are we progressing there and we're making great progress there. Today, if you see something is really hard in the studio, um, I know we have ton of feedback on that in that space. Um, I just want to make sure that um, you understand that we are making ton of improvements in that space. Um, so other things, some things like content approval status, content approval comments, and sensitivity label, especially if you had configured security and compliance labels, all of those are available in Flow and Power Apps now. So you can have uh, a document library, content approval, and say if this, uh, what's the content approval status for this library, uh, sorry, for the document, you will get that in Flow as well as in Power Apps, which I know many people, uh, many customers were using that to trigger more uh, business processes through Power Apps and Flow. Right. Um, so uh, I want to quickly um, do talk about that, um, you know, workflow or InfoPath. Workflow and InfoPath are pretty much, you should consider them um, no longer the recommended path for building business processes. Um, so future is now. Um, this is, I think we are investing a ton here now, uh, both in the product as well as in the transition. Um, so if you're uh, working with the customer and um, understanding what, when is the time for me to move, um, it is now. We are making, um, you know, basically um, working with customers to look at how they're using InfoPath, how they're using workflows in SharePoint Designer, and really looking at how we transition them to Power Apps and Power Automate. And uh, one of the things we uh, learned a lot is people really wanted an understanding of what is going on in their tenant and how people, uh, are, how their users are using these tools. So uh, the modernization scanner now has the ability to uh, give you a report on workflows and InfoPath usage. So um, I would highly recommend you download the latest. It gives you a really detailed analysis uh, for workflows and InfoPath. And the plus for using the scanner tool is if you use it for workflows, you will get the ability to see the upgradability score uh, of the workflows. Here are the workflows that are like 75%, you can convert them. 50%, you can convert them because of these uh, different things, right? And uh, for InfoPath, you get what are the web forms and what are the client forms and which ones were accessed, uh, modified last by users. So really useful, uh, but has done an awesome job uh, for this tool. And I do want to say that this is an open source product. We have customers taking this open source product and customizing the tool for workflows and InfoPath to include some of their specific deployments and specific controls that they have built and specific use cases they think are matters to them when it considering which workflows are important, which InfoPath uh, forms are important. Customers are taking that and customizing the tool to uh, scan for those specific things. So uh, don't think this as a product. Um, it is an ongoing effort that we are trying to improve. So if you want to participate, you know, we are very open to welcome you into the PNP community and uh, give uh, provide updates. As well as if you want your customers to adopt this so they don't really have to do it, it's an open source tool. You can do that as well. 2026 is here. It's almost here. Um, unless we stop users, um, you know, the death of uh, SharePoint design for increasing in a tenant, uh, you're going to have trouble after 2026. Um, the tools may not be available at all for download. And this is the third time Microsoft um, extended the date. So it's very highly unlikely that we will extend it again. So this is something you should really, really go look at, talk to your customers, and understand the needs and, and look at moving uh, customers from workflows and InfoPath to the Power Platform. Um, so uh, what can you do today? Well, in simple terms, you can start scanning, download the modernization scanner tool, scan your tenant for workflows and forms, trigger the act, triage the active and inactive entry. Like some things may be important, some things you will find out, geez, this was created two years ago. Why is this even there? Uh, this hasn't published at all, right? So things like that, triage them. And if you have uh, things like you want to go to specific site collection owners, you can go and do that as well. And finally, look at options to turn off SharePoint Workforce and InfoPath. This is something we see now many companies are interested. 
um, options are available in your tenant admin center. And um, if there is an option, you should go do it today uh, because that's going to help you stop the bleeding in your enterprise to not have more solutions being built in these old tools who are going to get um, the support uh, very soon. So um, I want to quickly, I have 15 minutes. Um, I want to quickly go to one thing which I haven't uh, really talked about in uh, in recent times, but which is how do we map InfoPath to Power Apps? I think workflow, we are seeing many customers uh, getting there with, here are the things that w w workflows provide, here are the things that flow provides. And I had a talk last year on that. Uh, maybe I can give another talk on that uh, later in the next year in the PNP call. But really, when you consider moving InfoPath to Power Apps, uh, there are three things you need to understand. Power Apps is not InfoPath. Um, you're not going to find the same thing as you did in InfoPath in Power Apps, or you're not going to find the other way around as well. InfoPath was built when iPhone 4 was released. Um, how many of us have iPhone 4? None of us, right? And um, let's also understand that Power Platform, which is a platform, has so much more uh, for you to integrate into business process and deliver value. And, and it's really understanding hey, 10 years ago, um, I was doing this. Um, now, what's my uh, opportunity to get more value? How uh, land, the, the things have changed since then, right? Um, it's all cloud solutions. There is like so many other integrated tools available now. How can I get more value out of those uh, Office 365 subscription and license? Um, and your Power Platform gives you the opportunity to connect to those uh, different data sources, even external data sources, uh, much easily than, let's say, in the previous world when we had those tools. So um, one of the things I did was I, I mapped the terminology keys that InfoPath folks are familiar with to Power Apps, right? So in InfoPath, everything is a form. In Power App, everything is an app, and the app will have uh, forms, right? List and library forms in Power Apps becomes custom forms. Fields are still fields, controls are still controls, but you also got the opportunity to build components, uh, which is a way to distribute a set of controls together. Repeating tables in InfoPath have uh, basically becomes repeating content using the gallery control. I'm going to show you a demo right now how to do that. Um, and then we have uh, data. So that's how you connect it to different data sources. In Power Apps world, it becomes the connectors and connections. Uh, rules really becomes uh, the things that you apply to properties of the control, uh, and you use expressions to do that. And finally, we have InfoPath Designer. Here we have the web-based product, Power App Studio. So uh, I'm going to quickly uh, uh, do the demo, but if you go to this link, which is my talk, uh, BRK2294 Ignite Talk, you can see my full demo and, and more information around uh, how we can modernize InfoPath to Power Apps. So I presented with Emma Cooper, who is one of the PMs in the Power Apps world. So um, I want to quickly show demo for integrated solutions. Um, this is going to be repeating tables. So um, if you want to see the full demo, really thanks to um, Shane, um, who has been doing a lot of Power Apps work. Um, I think he does nothing but Power Apps. Um, he went with this model, taking the same concept as we envisioned to like gallery controls or the repeating tables, right? So if you use that model, how would repeating tables work and what are the things you need to do? Um, so uh, this is the link. Um, I think if there is someone doing the chat, please paste this uh, information in the chat. And it's a three-part series um, for folks that are not familiar with uh, Power Apps. It might take some time, but for folks familiar with Power Apps, you will find uh, this to be really, really simple way to bring repeating tables. So I'm going to show you the demo uh, for that. Um, I built a simple thing uh, based on uh, Shen Yang's uh, documentation. So here's my regions. So I have multiple. Uh, I want to add multiple rows of regions in in one go. So here's my Power App. And here's my regions power app I built. So maybe in another call I can go in detail, but I'm going to show you the high level pieces that, that makes this work. So if you uh, play this, I can add regions. I get the options to add. So I can add USA. I can have language English. 
and owner, this is something very important, right? Now, um, in normal integrations with data sources, especially with SharePoint, let's say, I will have the ability to search for users because I already know it's a people field. Um, but what if I actually want to do something like repeating table? Well, I have the model of uh, enter the uh, you know email uh, or the name, and I can search Office 365, and it's going to come back with an email address. Great. Now I can add this in the repeating table. I can go back. I can say New Zealand. Oops, sorry, English, New Zealand, and owner. I can again search for Nestor, and then that hopefully comes back with his email address. And I can add another one. India, let me add Hindi, and owner. I don't know, yeah, okay, Patty, right? Now, if I save, only then this is going to go to SharePoint. Look at how fast that was. And now if I go back to my list, you should see USA, New Zealand. And the reason why it didn't add India is because I did not click plus. I basically uh, did not enter that into the uh, con collection. So that's why you didn't see that coming up here. Uh, but now this is really simple, right? Now you can like beautify this app and do whatever you want to do to make it uh, much nicer for users. So uh, the, the real sauce is in the gallery control. So the gallery control needs to hold values before you push to the data source. So what I'm doing here is I'm holding the values in a local collection called line items. And how that is get initialized is when you click add regions, I'm initializing a collection. It's basically clear collectors. It's clearing everything and it's, it's readying the uh, object for collection. And with the model, region name, region language, region owner, and I also have a add icon and, and a delete icon as well. Uh, but add icon is basically the key thing that I have here with true or false. And finally, I'm using user mail uh, string that I control for getting the data uh, of the user email from Office 365. And if you see the gallery control, uh, each of the text box, so this text box right here, region name is mapped to region name, right? So that's the property you saw in the line item collection. And similarly for language, it's mapped to the region language. For owner, it's mapped to uh, in a different way where it's checking some conditions and saying it is user mail and then mapped to region owner. Now what happens when I click search is that uh, I am uh, using the Office 365 connector to search the user based on the text value that people have entered into the text box. And then if I find something, I am getting the mail property from that object. And I'm just getting the first object. So you could have more conditions to, to select the user you want. Um, and then I am setting that into a local object, again, user mail. And then I'm setting the text owner email control dot text property to the user mail. So that's how I get the value for the user email from Office 365 and then set it. Now, when I click plus, uh, it basically patches, right? Um, you're adding a value to the collection. So what is the value I need to add? Well, whatever I have in the current line item in the gallery control. So I get line items and this item refers to the current item. And then I set the values for region name as the respective control values. And finally, I said the add icon false. So I don't want to see the add icon anymore, right? I want to see the delete icon going forward so that I can have users delete the line item rather than having more uh, confusion over showing the add icon. And finally, uh, I also now collect an empty line item. So I added one, and I also want to show an empty line item so user can start typing the details for the next line item. And then since I'm using a local variable to also collect the email, which is coming from Office 365, I set that as empty. So the email control text box also has an empty value. So that's the way how I am doing the repeating table with the plus sign and, and also having a way for users to delete. 
And finally, the secret sauce, when you save. Now the logic is you have everything in the line items collection. So let's iterate through that line item collections and patch the SharePoint data source, right? The SharePoint data source is I've connected to the regions list in my site, and I'm saying uh, the patch function, which is saying patch this data source, in which case it is a regions list, and patch with the default uh, values uh, that I want to pass, which is uh, all the columns, right? And now it's very easy. Um, title is going to be the region name property when you iterate through every line item. Language is going to be the region language. And the owner, this is where it gets complex. It's a people person column in SharePoint. I know this is really, uh, this really looks ugly. Trust me, we're going to make this better. And the reason why we are doing this and working on this and showing this is because we can learn these things and go back in the product and fix these things. So uh, this is one of the things uh, we uh, certainly have in our radar to simplify repeating tables, especially for users coming from InfoPath. So it's a, um, you would have to right now cut, copy, paste uh, this and, and basically use it in your uh, solution if you're doing it. I think Shane has uh, this in his blog post as well. Um, so basically this, you're giving the OData representation of the people uh, person column in SharePoint that is how it's represented in Power App. So you're using that, and you're basically uh, mapping the uh, region owner, which is the email address, to that particular field. And finally, uh, this will go and patch the data in SharePoint. After it comes back, we're basically now setting everything to empty list, right? So we clear collect. We are clearing the collection and getting it ready for the next set of uh, rows to be added to SharePoint. So that's how we do uh, repeating tables um, in in uh, Power Apps. It's it's really a little bit uh, harder today for especially users that are used to doing the UX way. Uh, but this is something we are looking to improve next year and see how far we can push the product to do the thing for the user rather than users specifying all of these stuff to do uh, in using expressions. But a good start. We have seen a lot of people adopt this. So if you are looking for like repeating tables is the one that stops me from moving InfoPath to Power Apps, well, fear not. We have options and solutions for you. And these are all supported ways to build these things. So uh, that's another good thing. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Um, there are a lot of um, customer stories. If you're looking to uh, look at how other companies are transforming the business process using Power Apps and uh, Microsoft Flow, Power Automate. You can go to the link and um, basically look at all of the stories in detail. Uh, there's also a roadmap slide. If you go to my um, talk from Ignite, I have the roadmap slide there as well. And this presentation, if you go to the Ignite link again, you can download it. So uh, if you are looking for that, that's also available. Uh, well, that's for me. Uh, that's it from me today. So, Jackson, there was a few questions which we didn't actually go through. Just now, I'm going to steal the presentation. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we'll flip it yep. uh, here. Um, and let's go to the Q&A. Um, there was one question which was related on the filtering of column visibility. Uh, so that was around, is the filtering of column visibility in the lists, is it based on a content type or is it based on a list? So can you filter out columns based on a content type? Um, it is for the columns available in all content types. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's the answer to that. We don't do content type filtering. Yep. Yet. Yet, yes. One step at a time, one step at a time. Now, the next one was interesting as well because this is in the top five of user voice. Um, any news on the customizing a modern list form using SPFX? So uh, we are thinking around having JSON formatting than SPFX. Uh, it's very early in the stage, um, but we will have more updates uh, as we progress in the next year on giving the same abilities, how you do view and um, column formatting. Can we take that learning and feedback and drive uh, out of the box list form customization as well? Yeah, I think the, the question is more on, on the fact that uh, pro developers want to override the editing form and view form and the whole experience. Right. So we, um, I mean, I'll be open and honest. We are going to first fix the platform to allow it to do for 
uh, a common way to customize the list forms. We don't have that. Um, and that's something we are focused on. Once we cross that stage and we have the ability for both power users and um, you know, UX-driven customizations, um, we can apply that. Now, one good thing is that uh, we have, uh, you know, it's all JSON formatters, uh, scripting, which exists in uh, SharePoint through views and formatters. We can easily bring that to SPFX if you want to. Uh, but the whole notion of give me the entire form um, so I can do whatever I want to do, that work item, we are a long way ahead to do that direction yet. Yeah. Yeah, and, and if there's a high demand for it, please vote to user voice entry. Um, user voice absolutely has an impact on our prioritization. That's why we are collecting those votes. Uh, if it's not, yeah, uh, uh, it, yeah. So that's that's how things happen. Now, uh, coming back on Jim Duncan's comment, so if a column exists into a content type, we will hide it. It will hidden in both. Answer is true uh, on the chat window. But we're running out of time. So uh, the next community call uh, is on this Thursday. Uh, we will have actually uh, two uh, wonderful ladies joining us on this Thursday. So Julie Turner is going to talk about the latest on the learning pathways, uh, which is a really, really cool uh, end user adaption solution, uh, which is an open source, partially open source at least. And then Melissa Torres is joining us on a Thursday, Thursday to talk about the latest on site designs and site scripts. So based on her talk uh, from Ignite as well. So we, we tried to use, um, we tried to cover that within the Melissa's talk back in November monthly call, but we did run out of time. So luckily Melissa is joining up on us on Thursday. Uh, the next SharePoint Framework community call is December 19th, uh, so a week from now. And that's it for now. So uh, AKMS, SVPMP for all of the additional informations. And thank you, Jax. Thank you, everybody who were active on the chat. Uh, we are getting all the time yes. feedback that the chat is one of the most valuable things I did in this call. But thank you, everybody. And let's stay in touch. Bye-bye. Thank you.